I find that I continuously come back to old musical instruments and other elements of ancient culture to find meaning, to find inspiration. Now, <laughs> I'd like to explain a little bit about why this is. Um, there's a problem for me, a logical problem, and the problem is very often when we get involved in the new technology, I think it's easy to forget who we're doing it for. When we say that something is artificially intelligent, it's almost as if we think that we're creating this new life and we're doing things for the benefit of that new life form, this new computer thing. <laughs> uh, and this has practically become a new religion uh, in the technology world, that we're creating this, this new form of intelligence that might even take over the world, that might surpass people. And when I hear that, and I hear it a lot, believe me, it's very, very common, I start to feel, no, this is crazy. This is crazy because it makes us absurd. Now, I'd like to give you a very specific story to explain why I think this is absurd and why I keep going back to the world of human culture from before computers in order to figure out how to make computers better, okay? So, I want you to consider one very special story, which is what's going on with the careers of people who translate between languages. Right now, you're probably hearing me translated into Turkish through the efforts of some fine person I haven't met, so thank you for translating me, whoever you are. Now, here's the thing that bothers me. In recent years, the careers of people who translate between languages have been challenged because many of the jobs they used to do, like translating little news stories or memos, Many of these jobs have been taken over by automation. Right now, you can go on many websites, uh, Microsoft, Google, others, and you can get free translations. Now, I love the idea of instant translations being available online. I have no problem with that as an invention. It's fantastic. I've contributed to it. However, there's something screwy going on. The careers of human translators are being harmed while there's more and more use of the artificial intelligence translators. But here's the thing. In order to keep the artificial translators working, we, and I say we because I'm working with Microsoft now who provides one of these services, we have to go out into the world and take tens of millions of examples of fresh translation every day without asking permission and without letting people know we've taken their translations. We find amateurs who translate movies, we find people who translate poetry, we find all these people online and we simply take their examples. Now, why do we need to do it every day? The reason is that language is alive. Every single day there are new news stories. Every single day there's new pop culture. Every single day there's new internet culture. And if we don't have these new examples, the illusion of artificial intelligence will stop working. And it is an illusion because the types of programs we know how to make don't represent meaning. All they do is statistics, correlating things that have been said before with new things that are said to create a translation that works. So here's the strange thing. We're telling people, you're obsolete, the machine is replacing you, but in fact, we still need them. And so this leads to a problem. One problem I think is just spiritual for us in that we're lying and lying is bad. We're pretending not to need people when we do need people. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that we're creating anxiety. We're sending out this message 
that people will become obsolete. And I think it creates tremendous anxiety. I've recently heard students in high school start to say things that I've never heard before. If we are going to be made obsolete by computers, why did our parents have us? These horrible things that, that, that hurt me to hear. And this is all based on an illusion. We still need those people. All computers do is connect people together. They connect human efforts together. There's no effort or intelligence or data or anything coming from supernatural aliens <laughs> or any other. It's only from people. All we can do is help each other through these computers. That's the only thing we can do. And then another problem is because we're pretending we don't need the people, we can't just ask them for what we need. We have to be sneaky. <laughs> we have to say, we hope we'll find the good translation examples, but it's very indirect. So here we have a serious problem. We're making the technology not as good as it could be. We're creating anxiety, and we're lying. Now, none of these problems have anything to do with the actual algorithms, with the actual computers, with the usefulness of the tool. All of those things are great. The problem is in the way we're thinking about these things. And it seems to me what we have to do is think of people as being special. We have to think of people as being something beyond computers. Whether it's absolutely true, I can't prove. It's a matter of faith. But as soon as we treat people as being these special things, maybe then we can be more honest about our technology. Then we can say, you know what? This technology is wonderful. It helps people help each other better than before. But it still comes from people. If that happened, we would be paying the translators instead of them feeling that they were becoming obsolete. They would be finding a new style of career, a new source of sustenance, a new form of dignity. We would make the technology better because we'd more, be more honest about how it works. Everything would get better. <laughs> so for me, the path to making technology better is in a funny way by paying attention to everything that isn't technology, to paying attention to the sacredness in people. Okay, so this brings me back to music. If, from my perspective, technology is a way of people connecting, of people working together, of people sharing information, of people expressing things to each other, then the measure of how good a technology is, is how expressive it is, how good it is at bringing something forward from inside of you that otherwise would not be shared with other people. And when I look at the history of mankind, I come to the conclusion that the most advanced technologies so far are not virtual reality or artificial intelligence or the internet, but instead musical instruments. There's some instruments that seem to touch the soul, the soul more closely than others that are deeper. And of those, one of the ones that um, I find very, very close and very, very intimate and profound is the oud. And from the United States perspective, when I think of the city of Istanbul, of course, the first thing I think about is, oh my god, all the wonderful oud players there, the oud culture. I'm going to play you oud. Um, <laughs> which is kind of nuts, but it's going to happen. So this is a California-style oud music.
in a funny way, it's been a dream to play Oud in Istanbul, but it's also um, crazy, so I, I only can offer this with great humility, and I appreciate your, um, your patience. Bravo! <laughs> Sharon, I, I know you've written your book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Social Media Accounts Right Now. Really briefly, <laughs> really briefly. Really briefly, why should you delete your social media? Yes. Okay, <laughs> super briefly. What happened was back in the 80s and 90s, uh, the people in tech culture like me had two ideologies which conflicted. On the one hand, we were sort of socialists and we wanted everything to be free. On the other hand, we love tech entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. If you try to combine them, there's only one solution, which is the advertising model. And at first, that was a great solution, but the problem is computers become more sophisticated, the algorithms get more sophisticated, and what used to be advertising turned into something else, which is a form of algorithmic addiction and uh, a kind of a soft version of mind control, you might say. It's very similar to gambling addiction. And the problem with it is it has terrible side effects. It makes people irritable and paranoid. It makes people unhappy. Uh, it is doing damage to the world. I think it's done terrible damage politically. Um, I'm not gonna say who I'm thinking of, but you might remember I'm an American. And so, <laughs> You, you can, can make say guesses. Donald Trump. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> I, yeah, right. You know, I'll, <laughs> sure. So, so the thing is, um, I believe something like social media could be great, and the positive experiences you might exp you might have of it, of having fun, connecting with friends, and whatever, or promoting your career. All of these things are real. Unfortunately, the negative side is also real. And so, what we have to do is evolve the business in such a way that we get rid of the negative side and keep the positive side. It's going to be a challenge, but I felt um, morally um, responsible as part of the industry to make a fuss about this. And I think it's urgent that we change it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jaron Lania, thank you so much. Thank you.